uh, we've had such a huge uh, range of attendees talking on all different uh, elements of the pandemic. And obviously the Minister for Health was in the room where it happened, so to speak, and making these key decisions that have so enormously affected uh, not only uh, how we operate in our everyday life, but the economy. Um, there's a huge public health response uh, that he can speak to as well. And, you know, these are historic decisions that are being made every day with enormous consequences for uh, everyone right ac across the globe. So uh, we're delighted that he can join us uh, if we manage to get through these technical difficulties. Um, but Richard, I might just start with you. Um, while we're waiting for the minister to come on and hopefully we can sort that out soon. Please bear with us, everyone. I do apologize. Um, we are seeing that Australia has had a, a much, much more successful public health response at the very least compared to other nations. And a lot of economists and other commentators are now kind of talking about the trade-off, um, so to speak. Richard, do you, sorry, are you corresponding no. with the minister's office there? <laughs> do you just want to start us off with, oh, here we go. Thank you very much. That looks like we've got the minister now. I'll just sorry unmute. About that. That's all right. It's the first time we've had technical difficulties, so we've had a pretty good run and uh, it's only a few minutes. So well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's the first time you've had me, so it's not a surprise. It's the first time you've had technical difficulties. <laughs> I was um, looking forward to filling in for you, mate. So <laughs> thanks for making it. Uh, um, seamless transition, it would have been, Richard. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, uh, we were just talking about the huge success that Australia has had in terms of its public health response uh, in response to the pandemic. But obviously that's had, you know, uh, a huge impact on our society. The Guardian report is reporting today that we've got only 704 active cases and a tragic 99 deaths. And that compares to, for example, 90, close to 90,000 deaths in the United States now and almost 35,000 deaths in the United Kingdom. And I just wondered if you could reflect as the minister, there were a lot of difficult decisions that had to be made very quickly and sometimes with imperfect information, I'm sure, to avoid those thousands of unnecessary deaths. And we've got uh, a lot of uh, commentators and some economists now kind of talking about the fact that perhaps we overreacted. I just wondered if you could start us off um, with yeah, your sure. response to that. <laughs> I, okay. Well, uh, firstly, thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, you know, to everybody for what you've been doing. I know there's a range of people from different backgrounds on this, but you have public health and you have epidemiology and uh, you've got the science and as well as having the economics community. So, the, you know, the starting point is, of course, the counterfactual. And we can look at, um, you know, countries we know incredibly well, the US, the UK, France, Italy, Sp <coughs> Spain, um, and many, many others. And they provide a counterfactual. But there is also a misinterpretation that's sometimes put on them because they have all taken enormous measures. Sometimes it's presumed that they're not taking significant measures. Uh, CityMapper does a, a great uh, analysis of movement um, in, I think, about 50 major cities. At the same time as Australian movement was down in Sydney and Melbourne to 12 and 13% through April um, of its normal. In New York, in London, Milan, Barcelona, San Francisco, it was down to 5% or below. And I think in uh, Milan and Barcelona, it was a 2 and 3% of normal. So they had massive, massive uh, restrictions placed on them, but it was the time in the course of the disease progression where these things were put in place. And so that is absolutely the essential element as to when these steps were taken um, in, each of the, in each of the countries relative to where the disease was. And so uh, having said, so the counterfactual is not, you know, New York or London, it's what would have happened if there was no action that's the starting point. And so the predictions of 
you know, between 50 and 150,000 lives lost, I think we're absolutely right that if you had a no action situation, um, and then, you know, you would have headed towards a, a, you know, a whole of population coverage. And if you had 15 million people, uh, 1% of, uh, of, of that in terms of human life is, you know, unthinkable and unspeakable. So stepping back, uh, essentially, the, there are a series of factors in Australia. We set very early on the two pillars of containment and capacity. This is, you know, flattening the curve and lifting the ability of the hospitals to deal with the worst case. And the, the containment was built around the four elements of uh, the border control, of which the most important decision was the China decision on the 1st of February. And you know, many of you are associated with universities, so you'll be well aware that the, that decision on the 1st of February was not matched by our competitors in the UK and Canada. And so there was a lot of uh, upset amongst many parts of the economy, particularly the education and tourism sector, saying, well, others aren't doing this. And uh, our view at the time was, well, we think this is going to be absolutely serious, potentially globally catastrophic, and but we're going to take these decisions. And what was interesting is we'd already had uh, yeah, a large number of National Security Committee meetings after the 21st of, uh, of January. So the PM chaired them, convened them, brought in uh, the health experts, but brought in the whole national security apparatus. And so we weighed up the, the risks and then the responses, and then we set out the triggers. And when human to human contact was confirmed outside of Hubei, we acted there. At the same time, we were building our testing capability and our biggest risk was a uh, decrease in supply and an increase in demand for global tests. So we moved early to lock them in. And that was a constant fight through February, March and April to get that testing capability. And the same with masks. And then we were also building towards the ventilator capacity. Uh, the third was the contact tracing um, to lift the capacity of the public health units across all of the states and they've done a great job um, they've done a really good job and uh, in Victoria for example they went from 25 public health uh, uh, unit members for tracing to a thousand so they effectively established a um, disease detective workforce you know within a month and the app comes into that I think we're about 5.85 million as we speak might be a tiny bit more um, and uh, that's an additional element to the tracing, which other countries are now looking for our source code, and uh, they're very, very keen to take up what Australia's, Australia's done. Of the voluntary apps around the world, I think it's arguably the most successful so far. The uh, fourth of the areas is the one which is, along with the border closures, had the most economic impact, is the social distancing and the business closures. and. Uh, some would want a sort of stage four New Zealand style lockdown. Some would want a, uh, a more laissez-faire Swedish approach. We chose what we thought would have the highest uh, disease impact, but whilst maintaining manufacturing, mining and construction, for example. So we had a, a negative list of what wasn't allowed rather than the positive list of what would be allowed, particularly because we thought there would be massive unintended consequences in manufacturing, that if you close down a plastics manufacturer in Bayswater, who would know that four steps down the path, that would mean that you wouldn't have hose pipes for ventilators in Perth. So we were very cautious about that. Then the, uh, and so all of those four things are the ones that we put in place. And they, they've been the essential defence mechanisms. At the same time, we've done the capacity building in primary health. Um, there was a real risk in late March that uh, the GP workforce could have been overwhelmed. Many GP practices were beginning to self-close um, or be very, very cautious about patients coming. They were looking at what was happening in Italy and Spain in particular, and they could see the impact on health workforce. Uh, so telehealth was a fundamental step. We've now hit 10 million telehealth consultations, and I think that will be a permanent change to the landscape. Aged That's care. Encouraging. Hmm? That's uh, encouraging. 
Yep, the, the aged care facilities. Um, we've had you know, two very significant tragedies, but we have over 2,700 aged care facilities and we've had um, 27, I think, um, uh, that may have had an infection, maybe 28, depends on one is confirmed from overnight. Um, it was positive, now it's negative. It's, so let's call it approximately 1%. And our biggest fears are Indigenous communities and aged care facilities. Um, there hasn't been an infection in a remote Indigenous community. And uh, it's approximately 27 or 1% of the aged care facilities that have had an infection. And of those, only 10 have actually had resident infections. And so that's an extraordinary outcome. Um, and we provided a very significant supplement to keep aged care workers working because there was a fear that they would move. And then the last was the hospitals. And the hospitals we set out for the training and the ventilator capacity. And uh, we went from 2,200 uh, ventilators to 7,500 capacity around the system. Now, we're down, as of this morning, to uh, seven. Uh, people on ventilation around the country. So that's certainly extraordinary. If I can just interrupt you there for just one second and I'll, yeah, I'll just remind everyone that this is being uh, recorded, which I should have done uh, right at the beginning. Um, but that is absolutely an extraordinary uh, response. And obviously we can see the impact that that's had um, in the figures. Uh, Richard, I wondered if I might turn to you. Um, uh, did you have a, a question for the, the minister? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've got a couple of questions for you, but I guess the first one is, so the information available to you was, was available to uh, different levels of government in the US, different levels of government in the UK, different levels of government around the world. Um, uh, you know, without wanting to comment specifically on another country, what do you think other countries have done wrong? Were they, were they too slow to act or did they not believe the advice? I mean, we, we clearly we stand out and congratulations to you and to the states for doing what you've done. But what, what was the mistake that you think others made? Yeah, well, I mean, there are other strong examples. Obviously, Taiwan, New Zealand has done really well. Um, you know, New Zealand's figures are very, very comparable to ours. They're fractionally higher in case numbers and, and fatality rates across the nation. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's a few people. Uh, uh, Taiwan is a standout. Taiwan obviously had the experience with, uh, with SARS um, and they were, and, and they, they see things coming out of China that nobody else does. Um, they, you know, the, their people are interlinked, their, uh, you, know, you know, human intelligence on the ground is very, very strong. Uh, so we essentially, um, there was a very early series of meetings with, uh, the PM, Brendan Murphy, Paul Kelly, who's the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and myself. And we talked about the degree of risk. And I think the thing that happened here, so I won't define what others didn't do, I'll define what did happen here, is that you had the, the national leader who took this as a deadly serious existential threat. Um, and you can imagine the decision to close the borders with China to stop travel at the very moment all the students were about to arrive um, was a massive decision, but it was taken after six or seven days of preparation of a what if, uh, and then what do we do? And then on the day that it came, the decision was taken that day. So I think it was the speed of action and the structures through the uh, National Security Committee as the operating committee where we would make real-time decisions. Uh, but every decision was backed with, um, nothing was decided without papers going forward to it. So it meant that there had to be careful consideration in advance, but on the spot decision-making in a contested environment. And I think that was probably the most important part and a commitment from you know, the senior levels of government to uh, honour and accept the medical advice. Those are the things that stood out here that we were, you know, we gave primacy to the medical advice and uh, we had a structure which was designed for rapid decision making. So, uh, well, on that, I mean, the, obviously the economic and the social costs of those decisions were enormous. 
uh, we've been told for decades in Australia that there's so many decisions we can't make because we, we can't harm the economy. And to be clear, I'm, I'm glad you made the decisions you did. The economists, I think they were good economic decisions in the long run, but the, the short run economic costs are devastating. Um, how come we're allowed to harm the economy in addressing an existential crisis like this, but when it comes to other things, whether it's climate change or, uh, or, or welfare support, we're, we've so often been told we, quote, can't afford to do something or we can't make any decision that would have any impact on jobs or any impact. How, how as elected representatives, do you choose which problems we can harm the economy for and, and which ones we can't? Well, look, all the time you're making decisions. Um, if you are, you know, from ending, ending whaling a long, long time ago to now, you know, there are always decisions about uh, what you can and you, and you can't do. O on this occasion, um, the answer was pretty simple, that there was a massive threat to life uh, there was a massive threat to the hospital's uh, capacity to cope and that all of that would have had a, a very significant and profound long-term um, economic impact as well. But ultimately, we prioritised health above all else. Um, at the same time, we tried to minimise the economic consequences and to maximise the short-term interim supports and they are interim supports. I know some would prefer to see them as permanent measures, but you have to work within the capacity of what is possible. Now, our other equations are always a, a balancing act and sometimes we'll, we'll disagree on mechanisms as, you know, uh, as the many discussions you and I have had over the years, but- uh, You'll come around, you'll come around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we both live in hope. Uh, but, in any event, you know, in, on this occasion, we had uh, a combination of people and structures. And it is also worth remembering that, you know, for whatever criticisms of the WHO there have been, uh, they ranked Australia as, you know, at the global forefront of pandemic preparedness two years ago. And so successive governments had actually prepared for this. There's been some talk about, you know, had we done scenarios, we'd actually, just on my watch, and this, I'm not relating this to me, these were things that were built into the system, done three uh, major external pandemic uh, exercises and five major internal pandemic exercises in just the last three years. And that's built into the Australian system. The National Incident Centre, the National Trauma Centre, the National Medical Stockpile, all of those were sort of schooled and ready to go in the event of something like this. And we scaled up the National Incident Centre um, very, very quickly with defence, with logistics personnel, with purchasing, uh, with uh, finance, with legal, um, uh, as well as, you know, support for epidemiology from the medical community. So all of those things were able to be scaled up. And, um, you know, that, and that was actually part of a probably a 15 year program of Australia across successive governments putting that into place. And that was ready to go when this came into being. And then once that started, that constant flow of information from around the world and within Australia kept us very, very focused. You know, we could see what was going wrong in other parts of the world and we could see examples of who was getting it right. And I guess um, on that, sorry. How are we going for time, Minister? Can we hang on to you for a few, uh, few more minutes? Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, so I guess my next question is one, again, how, you know, how can we can solve some problems, not others? Do you, do you think that human nature means that we do respond to an urgent crisis different to a long one, a long-term one? And or do you think, as you said, because we actually have structures in place for dealing with pandemics, uh, and, and a range of other sort of long-term crises that the structures we have make it better. Is it, is it inevitable that humans will, will, will kind of, you know, jump from the burning platform rather than, you know, walk away from the sun causing skin cancer? Or, or, or can we fix these sort of longer-term, slower-burn problems? No, no, I mean, I, I've been, as you know, you know, optimistic about the long-term as well as the short-term. 
Um, now, not everybody, uh, I mean, I don't think there's any human inevitability to this because you look at the different responses of different countries and we're in the fortunate few. Um, others are, you know, doing it much tougher. And that in part is government response. In part, it was, you know, we used our natural advantages of being an island and we shamelessly used it. And uh, But anyway, having said that, uh, one of the things that is likely to come out of this is a uh, the potential for the National Cabinet. Um, and you say, well, what's different between the National Cabinet and COAG? Um, COAG was very much a, a set piece uh, movement. Uh, it was a bit like the trenches of the First World War. Everything was dug in. And, you know, there were a few pre-agreed agreements. This is a much more fluid dynamic where it really is the leaders and all of the pre-bureaucratic work has been stripped away and they've all come in uh, looking to solve things. And I'm pretty sure that across the board, every one of them is committed to trying to make that a new forum for um, genuine discussion, decision-making and agreement. Mm. Um, just um, one last question. Sorry, go ahead, Richard. We, we had Helen Clark on uh, one of our webinars last week, and not only have we had national cabinet with premiers and prime ministers, but obviously you, another prime minister joined recently from New Zealand. Uh, that that's you know a, a amazing new structure. Helen Clark suggested that perhaps an Australian New Zealand bubble uh, might allow for. Uh, the flow of students in the not too distant future and and similarly foreign students from other countries if they can quarantine uh, might be able to stay and study if they, if they go through a quarantine can you just quickly talk about where you think we're going to wind up in the next six months in terms of travel and openness to the world obviously yeah. starting with New Zealand starting with the Pacific makes some sense but you know uh, it's 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 a radical for any country to cut themselves off. I'm glad we did, but as, as health minister, where do you see this? And do yeah. you think the groups of students, for example, might be the first in? Uh, so both of those are not just possible, but they're planned. Um, so the first is in terms of the New Zealand bubble. That would be um, at about the same time or following not long after the state borders came down. You couldn't do it in Australia until the state borders are down. Um, and we would want to see uh, see that. Each of the states is working through that. Um, <coughs> the Queensland Premier gave a, a guideline yesterday, which was perhaps a little later than anybody had presumed in terms of Queensland. Um, we'll wait and see whether that happens a bit earlier. That's uh, later than any discussions internally. But uh, certainly uh, I would imagine that a New Zealand bubble could be in place uh, before the 1st of October, if not earlier. But I'm just working back now from Queensland states uh, when they were talking about it uh, yesterday. So uh, that, that makes very good sense. The second thing is quarantine is a 500-year-old concept. It comes from the Italian um, for 40, meaning 40 days. And uh, it's a, it's a well-established uh, well principle. And so... Uh, it's something that we're going to take forward as a highly likely pathway. I don't see, Brendan doesn't see, PM doesn't see any rapid access uh, to, uh, to people uh, coming through unfettered at borders until we have a vaccine. Um, we've had a bit of a discussion with CSL today and that's, you know, their view on the global vaccines is that that's progressing. Having said that, uh, we think the student quarantine, you know, mandatory quarantine, 14 days, self-paid, um, is a very real thing. And we're working with all of the universities and we're working with the states on that. And uh, I see for uh, skilled migration and for uh, student, uh, you know, international students, the 14-day quarantine program uh, being something that will become an Australian feature. And we've talked about that publicly. There's no surprise in that and we're working through and designing that right now. Great. <clears throat> Thanks very much Greg. I wonder if I might ask you a question. You were talking earlier about how National Cabinet works and what's different about that compared to COAG and 
I think you described it as um, a space where the medical advice was given primacy, um, but that was also still a, a contested space. Obviously, huge decisions were being made there. And I can think of schools off the top of my head as, as an area that seems to have been very contested. But can you just put us um, in that room? What is it like to be making those kinds of huge decisions? And, and um, can you just reflect a little bit more on how that new structure works and, and the, you know, absent the baggage of COAG? Well, I can't count for you in because I'm not in the room. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it is the, uh, the premiers, the cabinet secretary, and uh, you know, Brendan for all of the health, and then um, for the uh, you know, economics, it might be the Reserve Bank Governor or the Secretary of the Treasury that does the briefing. Anyway, having said that, uh, it, it, I was very involved with the PM in the preparation for it. We look back to the 1919 pandemic and the fact that both in 1919 and during the Depression, there was a massive splintering of the Federation. And so the PM went in um, to COAG just over two months ago, very focused on this idea of preserving the primacy of the medical expert panel, which is the body of chief medical officers around the country, um, because there were differing views and the medical community was beginning to fracture a little bit. Um, and also aware of that history, but faced with a potential crisis around mass gatherings in the middle of that meeting, he proposed on the spot in what will probably be the most important you know, uh, public policy decision of his life, the formation of a national cabinet. And all of the chief ministers and premiers I know um, with, with a great sigh said, yes, let's do that. And then they've operated in that structure. Now, like every cabinet, people bring different positions. And so there were different positions on school but they found a way through with the baselines. And what it's done is it's allowed people to operate in a uh, consistent fashion. Victoria has now come on board with a time frame. Uh, my own boy will be back in 12 days and counting. And, uh, and so, you know, these things are very, very uh, important. Having said that, uh, you know, yes, people bring differing views to it, but the degree of consensus has been remarkable and what I uh, you know the, the big history here is that compared with 1919 compared with you know 1930 to 32 even compared with the Second World War where there was a fracturing in the first two and a fraying in the third of the Federation this is the one great you know cataclysmic national event which has brought a consolidation of the Federation and so the mechanism all of the ministers prefer the fast moving structure. We've done it at a ministerial level. Um, and then, as I understand it, all of the, uh, the leaders prefer it. And so what happens is that they go in, they will debate and positions will evolve and move. And then there's a consensus at the end of it. Sometimes that will mean people can move at different paces, but the triggers and the structures are agreed. And that's what's been uh, extraordinary. I think everybody in there says, well, I'm only in this job for a certain amount of time. I want to get stuff done and I'm getting stuff done through this mechanism. That's what I'd call the breakthrough. Um, do we have time to keep you for perhaps two questions from our audience? No, of course. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so the first one I'll go to is from Catherine Kelly. She asks, are we manufacturing all our own uh, protective equipment in Australia or is some still being imported? Um, I wonder if you can speak to that. To, to begin yep. with? Uh, no, we're still signif uh, importing significant amounts, but we've created significant Australian manufacturing capability. Uh, ventilators, we're very fortunate because we've got ResMed and we've been able to uh, consume or, or to order and consume Australian production only. Um, test kits, we are working on a potential Australian capacity, but there was no significant Australian capacity. That was my biggest risk in all of this. Um, so we've had to continue bringing from overseas. Now, a lot of the world had broken supply lines. We kept our supply lines open, but every day um, we had our teams in industry and health sourcing from around the world, checking um, and, uh, and ensuring that the lines were coming. And in masks, we have very significantly increased our domestic production capability. 
we put in term in place long term orders, but we're still bringing from overseas because uh, just the bulk of what required meant that uh, we uh, still need overseas, but we've now supplemented it with a much stronger domestic production capability. And exactly how difficult is that in the middle of a global pandemic while so many other countries are, you know, obviously scrambling to do the same thing? What kinds of things come into play there with Australia being successful at securing those things? Uh, so they, I guess the early example is in February, we scoured the country for mask produ production. We really only found one, which was uh, Medcon, a small manufacturer outside of Shepparton. Uh, within a week, we turned them into a medium-sized manufacturer and within a month into a large manufacturer. We brought the army in and the army uh, worked around the clock, you know, going from one shift to three shifts. We had teams focus on uh, procurement of supplies. Uh, we had equipment brought in and uh, they taught the army how to do things. And then, uh, you know, they were providing the support on the ground. And then equally, we built contracts with other potential suppliers in Australia and we did you know, contracts through to the end of the year to justify the capital investment uh, and worked with the states and we're also working with the private market to ensure that there are offtake agreements. So what we did was we established procurement units for all of our at-risk supplies in the Department of Health and the Department of Industry. Department of Health more looking at overseas um, where they had contestable processes um, and we had the Department of Industry looking at the domestic production. Um, and if we've got time for one final question, we've got a whole range more. of people who, um, sorry, did you say you could take a couple more? Sure. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a whole range of people on here uh, wondering about whether or not we can take this success of putting experts in a role of kind of primacy and that expert advice, as well as the consensus um, that we've been able to achieve around the pandemic and apply it to a problem like climate change. I wonder if you can take us forward or indeed, you know, to some of uh, the planning that's happening now. And do you think um, we can take this new consensus and this um, value for expert advice with us? Oh, this is the, the platonic ideal of the philosopher king. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so, what, it, firstly, I think the, you know, there's a very real market for the national cabinet. Um, now, I'll wait for the leaders to make their own determinations and decisions, but, you know, they've spoken widely about that structure. Uh, secondly, we um, actually have tried to build strong support uh, mechanisms. And I think the King Review into Emissions Reduction was published today by Grant King, one of the experts in the field known to many of you. Um, and uh, that is informing uh, the next steps on that front. Now, I know there'll be plenty of debate in this audience, not about the reality of climate. That's, you know, for me, been a 30-year, 30 30-year 30 belief. Um, but uh, uh, about some of the mechanisms. Having said that, uh, you know, we're setting those targets and uh, uh, we're continuing to beat the targets. Now, some will argue for a tax on electricity. Um, others will argue, as we've done, for a reverse auction mechanism, um, simply as the lowest cost means of finding abatement. And Richard and I have had long discussions and debates around this. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think there, is, there will continue to be a role for the experts and we'll continue to draw on them. Now, I'll have one more and then, in fact, I have to speak on another uh, teleconference very shortly. I apologise. Uh, no worries. I've got one um, from uh, Melissa Sweet, who's a health journalist with Crokey, asking around the world, prisoners are recognised as extremely vulnerable populations for uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, what have you has, as health minister done to protect prisoners and to look after their families at such a worrying time? Yeah, so uh, right from February, we were very focused on what we call vulnerable populations. Obviously, the elderly and um, those in aged care and those in home care. Um, secondly, Indigenous Australia. Uh, but thirdly, were prisons. And so we had a prison plan with all of the states and territories. Now, I'd have to check, but to the best of my knowledge, 
uh, there have been no inmates around Australia that have been uh, infected and diagnosed. So we really built a, a very clear wall garden around all three of those um, institutions. And so we did that. And then we had plans of what if a prison were infected. And so in, in each of those cases, uh, we've had touch wood so far, very effective outcomes. And it, one of the Australian successes has been the fact that there have been over a million training modules on infection control that have been done. And all of those things together have meant that you know, people in whatever institution are very, very strongly uh, taking responsibility for their own infection control management. So at this point, uh, the, there are no known cases, uh, to me at least, of prison infections, but uh, you know, that's, that's a watching brief. Thank you. Uh, Richard, anything else from you before we wrap up with the Minister? No, I think we'll, we'll, we'll let him go. But thank you so much for your time today, Greg. Sorry about the technological problems at the beginning and thanks for your flexibility at the end. And um, yeah, please uh, keep talking to your state colleagues and, and keep, uh, keep, keep flattening that curve for us. Much appreciated. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks to everybody. And uh, I suspect the technological problems were probably mine. I mean, who would have thought that I'd be <laughs> responsible for launching the best-selling app in Australian history? <laughs> uh, uh, those that know me. But anyway... Uh, thanks to everybody. We just keep going. Take care. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and if people would like to hang around for uh, another five minutes, uh, Richard and I might uh, just wrap up a little there and touch on a few other things. Uh, as an economist, Richard, um, obviously we've had a lot of our supporters interested in the government's response on climate change and how we might take things forward. Um, Greg Hunt just mentioned the King Review there, but we've been very critical at the Australia Institute of, um, well, a lot of the government's response to climate change. But what are we seeing at the moment in terms of things that are being put in place now, as well as the, the Grant King Review, if you've got any um, further comments on that? Uh, look, I, I, I don't think you could say, and, you know, I say this to Greg, you know, I don't think Australia is, is leading the world in, in climate emission reductions in, in the way that we have with um, our response to COVID-19. Uh, we, we're reducing energy emissions in, in some sectors, we're having some success in some places, but Australia's emissions are rising. Uh, we, we got rid of a perfectly workable, effective carbon price. And of course, we you know want to massively increase our, our coal exports and our uh, and our gas exports. It, it makes absolutely no sense. Now, Greg's a former uh, climate change minister. Um, uh, the direct action policy he introduced was was not as good as the one that um, uh, that it replaced. But I, I don't think everyone realises that uh, if if direct action didn't pass, we we would have literally had no climate policy. Um, you know, I guess it's another conversation perhaps we can have with him one day, whether he'd do it on air or not, who knows. But, you know, Cabinet is about getting a whole bunch of people to agree on things. And what's fascinating for me, and I think what we should all appreciate, is that the, not only is the, the, the Federal Cabinet agree with some massive changes in a very short period of time. I mean, closing borders, spending $200 billion dollars you name it, not only did Cabinet do that, but Cabinet worked with the state premiers and we built national consensus around that. And I think as citizens, we should all be pretty proud of that. I think we should all be pretty pleased with that. But more importantly, I think we should all be pretty demanding and think, okay, so we can do that. We've been told for years that you can't solve big problems. We've been told for years that uh, you can't solve a problem if, uh, if you know, it, it harms part of the economy. Well, we now know that that's all rubbish. So uh, I think the fascinating issue, which, which time will tell, is how, if at all, did the bushfires over summer have an impact on the Prime Minister coming into this crisis? The Prime Minister was pilloried for ignoring evidence over summer. He was pilloried for trying to do it all by himself. Uh, and he was really having a bad time politically uh, and uh, and from a from a from a personal and governance point of view, but in the lead up, sorry, in in, in the aftermath of all that, we see a evidence based response that's cohesive, 
and broad. So, yeah, I, I don't think you could say the government's doing a good job on climate policy. I think they're a long, long way from that. It's a disaster. But I think we have seen a new approach to decision making, one we've never suspected was even possible. The question is, how, how do we generalise that? How do we take this approach and move it on to another problem? Um, I will just say, uh, for anyone who's interested in a little bit more on climate politics, uh, there was, I think, Four Corners on last night on ABC, and uh, I myself participated in the ABC's podcast, Hot Mess, I think, which is available as a podcast and broadcast on Sunday mornings. Uh, I was talking about the role of the Minerals Council and the Business Council of Australia in damaging Australia's climate policy. Um, so that's a long-standing uh, interest of ours. But just to wrap us up, Richard, and I want to thank everyone who's stayed with us during the early technical difficulties that we had. And uh, obviously we couldn't get to as many questions as we wanted to for the minister, um, but we do appreciate you all uh, sticking with us. Um, but I would just wanted to wrap up, Richard, going back to that initial question that I asked. So obviously we've got um, a huge number of commentators now talking about, um, you know, the fact that we just overreacted and by the fact that we've got such small numbers now and the huge impact that it's had on the economy means that we, we made the wrong decision um, initially. What are some other things that we might be considering that would put that kind of question into a bit more context? Uh, look, you know, it's interesting. I must admit, I, 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 hadn't, I hadn't heard the minister make the point that he did this morning, and I think it's an important one. Um, look at America. It's, yeah, you know, 90,000 deaths. But then 90,000 deaths didn't come because they did nothing. It's because what little they did happened too late. So in Australia, we can't just compare ourselves to America or to England. We have to compare ourselves to an even worse outcome because the Americans have done something. The English have done something. They just didn't do enough and they didn't do it fast enough. So, yeah, to those that say, you know, we should have let it rip. Uh, I mean, as an economist, first and foremost, I'd say, well, that the purpose of the economy, the whole point of economic activity is to make us healthy and wealthy and hopefully wise to be prosperous. Well, not only does this disease, uh, unconstrained kill enormous amounts of people. It makes a far larger group of people quite sick. And imagine living in New York. Imagine going to sleep at night or trying to go to sleep at night and being unable to go to sleep at night because every five minutes a siren taking one of your neighbors, one of your friends to the hospital where they might die is keeping you awake all night. The, the, the trauma for the communities that have gone through this in London, in New York, in in northern Italy is is enormous. So the, the the idea that we can just multiply the number of dead people by an arbitrary amount of money and say, well, that's the cost, you know, well, that's what we've saved, you know, it's 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 ridiculous. So uh, I think Australia has acted early. That's a, a good lesson for everybody. Uh, we have put health of people. One ahead. that might apply to climate. Well, but <laughs> this earlier is, is better. And we absolutely have to say, well, what, what are the lessons out of this? The lessons are we can do it, comma, when we want to. When we want to do it, we can. And we've chosen to do it in relation to this crisis. And we've chosen not to do it in relation to a whole bunch of things. Climate change, indigenous disadvantage. It's a whole bunch of problems we just keep kicking into the long grass because we say they're hard. Or to fix them will have some adverse impact on the economy. Well, as the minister said, Getting rid of whaling was bad for the whaling part of the economy. Uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19 is devastating for the tourism and education industry. Well, you know what? Tackling climate change will be bad for the profits of people who sell coal and oil. It will be. Um, the question is, what do we all want to do about that? And we've just shown that we can come together and act and act fast and act consistently. Uh, the democratic question going forward is, what other problems will we aim that at? Um, and I know I said that was my last question, but you've just made me think of something else. So um, we have been talking about, um, and then I'll wrap up for uh, everyone who's, who's still with us. Um, we're seeing a lot of talk and the Minister for Energy pushing this idea of a gas-led recovery and a recovery that's underpinned by fossil fuels, which is obviously going to be terrible for the climate. But what are the economics of, of 
gas at the moment, let alone the, the climate impacts? And, you know, is that the way that we should be going? Uh, look, you know, the, the gas industry has been telling us they're the transition fuel for climate action for 30 years. And Australia's, you know, still burning enormous amounts of coal. Once upon a time, I think the gas industry could have played a constructive role. But because we've burnt so much coal in the last 30 years, because we've ignored science for so long, We've now put so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already. We've used up so much of the carbon budget uh, that there's just not time to, to, to muck around with transition fuels like gas. That's, those days are over. So uh, the, the atmosphere tells us it doesn't have enough room for gas emissions. And the economics says, look, renewables are just cheaper already. And if Australia... If Australia spends tens of billions of dollars propping up the gas industry now and installing new infrastructure and new gas generators now, um, all that means is in five years time, we'll have more expensive electricity than if we'd spent the same money on renewables. So uh, we need to transition away from all fossil fuels as fast as we can. That's what the science says. And we should be building things that provide the cheapest, uh, the cheapest energy we can that's what the economics says. Luckily, the science and economics are telling us exactly the same thing. Just crack on and install a lot of renewables and a lot of storage and do a lot of work on energy efficiency. It's just people who own oil and gas that think we should sell oil and gas. Well, you know, Kodak thought we should still be using print in our cameras. <laughs> Um, thanks for that, Richard, and thank you to everyone who's come along today. Uh, we might wrap it up there, uh, but we do appreciate you coming along. If you um, have enjoyed these webinars and our Economics of a Pandemic webinar series, please come along tomorrow. We're speaking to Zali Stegel, the independent member for Warringah, for a chat about the role of climate action in the economic recovery. So if you've enjoyed um, the elements where we've touched on climate change today, certainly come along for that. You can register at tai.org.au forward slash webinars and make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, and there we've touched on a whole range of issues. Um, but today's episode is going to be on that very idea of a gas-led economic recovery. Um, and please stay home if you can, keep washing your hands and stay safe. Thank you. And I hope to see all of you tomorrow. And thank you again for all of your patience uh, during our technical difficulties right at the beginning. We really appreciate your support um, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks everyone. And thanks for Richard. Oh, Bye. and thank you very much to Greg Hunt for uh, being our special guest today. We appreciate the time that he was able to make available to us. Yep. Thanks Greg. Thanks everyone. <laughs>